Good morning and welcome to Calvary Fellowship Church. Thank you for joining us online. We would love to connect with you so that we could let you know more about our church. Send us a message or an email, and as we continue our study on prayer, let's sing together. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god age to age he stands Ah! 
has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? in our in-person church services, we've been spending some intentional time in prayer as we're journeying through the model prayer prayed by Jesus. In these services, we've asked different people in our church to lead us about specific topics as we've been praying about our education, our teachers, our students, we've been praying for our country and the world through all of these different times. And so this morning as we pray, I want to ask you to join me as I lead us in prayer, but that you also pray that we ask God to continue to work and to move in our nation, in our cities, and around the world. But not only that, that as we pray, we ask God to do a work in us, that we would hear His word, and that we would respond to Him today. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can gather together to pray to you and that you hear us. And we know that the Bible says that as we pray, we know that you hear us and that we can have confidence that you hear us. And so, Father, this morning, we pray that you would work in our lives. God, we pray especially for the many issues that are going on in our nation, in our cities. And, Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would um, work and move in each of those. God, that as Christ followers, that we would be slow to speak and quick to listen, but most of all, that we would be obedient to you and what you have for us. Father, I pray for our leaders that are making decisions and leading the way, God, that they would lead with Christ-like attitudes. And Father, that the church 
would be a great picture and reflection of who you are. And God, as we continue our study on prayer this morning, I pray that each one of us would be open to what you have for us, that we would not let things continue to distract us, but Father, that we would hear your word and what you have for us today. So speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dead is a concept that we all understand, a concept that we find repeatedly addressed in the Bible, but in multiple ways. As I begin the message this morning, I want to share just a sampling of verses that speak about debt. In Deuteronomy 15.1, we read, At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. This forgiveness of debt is within the nation of Israel. God's people were to release the debts owed to them by other brothers every seven years. Proverbs 22:26. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in pledge, one of those who is a surety for debts. In other words, don't put yourself responsible for someone else's debt. There's a warning here about co-signing for a friend's debt. Proverbs 22, 7, the borrower is slave or servant to the lender. And then in the New Testament, Romans 1, 14, Paul writes, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Paul says that he was in debt to those who did not know the gospel. He was indebted to share the gospel with them. Romans 8, 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We are debtors, in other words, to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who brought spiritual life to us. Therefore, we give ourselves freely and completely to the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 27 says, It pleased them indeed that they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. The Macedonians, who were in the area of modern-day Greece, shared their wealth with the poor saints in Jerusalem because it was the Jews who had brought the gospel up into Macedonia. And so the Macedonians felt indebted to give of their um, abundance and wealth to the poor saints in Jerusalem. They saw that as a debt to those Jews in Jerusalem. Romans 13, 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. It's an ongoing debt to love one another in the church. And then one more. Luke 11, 4 says, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now that sounds really familiar because that's part of the model prayer that we've been studying over the last several weeks. We've been focusing on Matthew's account of the model prayer, and in verse 12 we read, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus is using the word for debt there to mean and refer to sin. Folks, sin is our greatest problem. It affects everyone. All of us have sinned against God. Now, the Bible has different words for sin. It means to miss the mark, to fall short of God's standard. This word debt or sin also means crossing the line as in trespassing. God established righteousness, and to sin is to cross the line of his righteousness. Sin is total lawlessness or rebellion against God. It's not always premeditated. Sometimes it happens because we're just by nature sinners. And then another word is this word debt. What sinners owe God because of our sin. All people owe God obedience, yet all of us have failed to pay up. Saying that sinners have a debt to God means that we have failed to give God 
what he is due. And that is a life of obedience and worship. So everyone obviously needs God's forgiveness. Now there are two aspects of forgiveness that I think are really important for us to understand. First, there is judicial forgiveness. This is when God, as the judge, pardons sinners on the basis of their faith in Jesus, evidenced by genuine repentance. It's being saved. It's being justified. When God, as the judge, brings his gavel down and declares that we are righteous on the basis of our faith, not on our performance, but on faith. And that decision, our faith response to God and faith in Christ, is, is what brings us into a relationship with God. So that's judicial forgiveness. There's another aspect of forgiveness that is really important, and that's the idea of fellowship or communion with God. That is to remain in a right relationship with God, we need daily forgiveness. That is, we confess our sin and God gives us his forgiveness. This is the focus of what we're reading here in the model prayer in verse 12. Jesus is not addressing the aspect of salvation here, but one of fellowship. Salvation, folks, is never achieved by our performance. You can't earn God's forgiveness even by forgiving others. So that is not the meaning here of verse 12. Peace with God never comes by way of our performance, but by God's pardon. So as we drill down here on verse 12, give a, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let me share with you three really important instructions that Jesus has given us. Number one, Christ followers need daily forgiveness. This is a prayer for believers. It's addressing our intimacy and fellowship with God. Forgiveness is a daily need, just like our need for daily bread. We are dependent on God's forgiveness each day in order to have fellowship with him. That's why, again, it's so important that we savor his presence. Verses 9 and 10, that we park it there first and savor the presence of God, hallowing his name asking for his rule and reign to come down upon us and that his will would be done and not our own. Then we ask for bread, but then we also confess our sins and we seek his forgiveness as we also forgive others. So we need this daily forgiveness. And you know, that's what Jesus was teaching the disciples in John chapter 13. If you recall that chapter, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and he comes to Peter, and Peter says, you will never wash my feet, to which Jesus says, if I don't wash you, then you have no part with me. Well, Peter immediately said, well, Lord, not just my feet then, but also my hands and my head. Jesus again said this to Peter, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean. In other words, Peter, you've been justified, but you need ongoing sanctification. In other words, you've been saved, but there is still a daily need for cleansing of sin. It's about the daily dust of sin. Every day, folks, we as Christ followers walk into wrong motives. We stand and linger in twisted thoughts we bump into people who are difficult to like and even to love. We use our mouth to condemn and criticize other people for similar things we do. And that's why we need 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9, where John writes, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
As we think about that verse, and as we think about our need for daily cleansing, I think it's really important for us to give specificity to our confessions. God deserves specificity from us as we are confessing our sins. In other words, I don't think we should just pray, hey God, if I, if I did anything wrong today, please forgive, forgive me of that. I think what God is telling us here and reminding us is that we need to be very specific about our offenses toward God. He deserves that. So that perhaps means there needs to be more self-awareness in our own heart's desire and words spoken and hidden motives. That throughout the day we give thought to that and that there's a a greater self-awareness of what's going on in our own hearts. So question, before we move on to number two, when's the last time you prayed and lamented over the condition of your heart? Jesus is telling us and reminding us that we need daily forgiveness. Number two, Christ followers forgive. (laughs) That's what we do because that's what we have received. We have been forgiven, and there must be that sense in which we readily and graciously and generously forgive others. Let me share with you some thoughts that June Hunt says about forgiveness and what it's not. She writes, first of all, forgiveness is not a natural response, but supernatural. You might be thinking, well, I can never forgive that person. That may be true. You might think that way, but with Christ being in you, you can. And you must. It's who you are. You're a Christ follower. She also says forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. You see, forgiveness is one way. Reconciliation is two ways. Forgiveness is is a personal decision on the part of the victim, regardless of the offender's decision to offer you an apology. In other words, we're not talking about reconciliation here. That takes two people coming together. Forgiveness is a willful choice on your part to extend forgiveness because you have received God's forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision and an act of the will. Feelings are not necessary in order to forgive someone's debt against us. And I know there could be a lot of emotions with this. But we must simply know that God commands us to let go of the claims that we are holding against a brother or a sister. June Hunt says one more thing here that I want to mention. Forgiveness is not excusing the wrong or letting the guilty get away with it. All behavior is wrong and is without excuse. If you forgive, you are not saying that the offense against you was never wrong. You're not saying, "Eh, what you did, it's okay, it's no big deal. That's not what forgiveness is. You're not letting someone off the hook. Forgiveness is when you move the guilty from your hook to God's hook. That's forgiveness. It's what Paul was talking about when he says in Ephesians, give place to wrath. Yeah, you've got some wrath here. And you. what do you do with that? Where does all of this emotion and anger and wrath, that intent, uh, maybe malice, that intent to do someone else harm, what do we do with all that? Where does all of that go? It goes to the cross the same place where God's wrath was poured out. It was on his son on the cross. And folks, that's what Peter is getting at in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, speaking of Jesus. Jesus committed himself to God who judges righteously, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. You're not letting the person off the hook for the sin against you. 
you are passing that offense onto the cross and leaving it there. Jesus suffered on the cross and all of our sin was placed on him and all of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. And Jesus took it and died for you. So that's how God can be just in forgiving us because the penalty and the payment for our sin was placed on Christ. So for us to deal with our, you know, the, the fences against us, what do we do with all that? We put it on the cross because that's where the wrath of God took care of those offenses. You know, forgiveness has nothing to do with fairness. Think about, you know, sometimes we, we think about what is fair or not fair, and that can be a huge obstacle for us in forgiving others. The thinking might go something like this. Well, because of what happened to me, and how that wasn't fair, it's only reasonable to expect that my offender pay. I want that person to pay and hurt in the same way they hurt me. They owe me that, at least that. It would be unfair if my offender didn't suffer like I've had to suffer. You see, folks, forgiveness has nothing to do with fairness, but everything to do about obedience. It is an obedience issue. Colossians 3.13, God tells us, forgive one another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. It's an obedience issue to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. Forgiveness is also a gospel issue. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, forgive one another even as God in Christ forgave you. God has forgiven you and therefore we must forgive others. Christ followers are the most forgiven people in the world and therefore we should be the most forgiving people in the world. And it's a powerful statement to someone who is not a Christ follower, who has offended you, for you to reciprocate with forgiveness. It's a gospel issue. Forgiveness is also a personal issue. You choose to forgive regardless of your offender. You're choosing to follow Christ's example. I read this illustration that kind of puts it in perspective. Two men in the church had a falling out. They both were really upset with one another. One of the men told the preacher and said, you know what, I don't think I could warm up to that guy even if we were cremated together. To which the preacher replied, that's true, but if you were crucified together, you might have a shot at it. You know, there is so much selfishness in all of us. But in Philippians chapter 2, we are reminded of how Jesus humbled himself, that he, he relinquished what was rightfully his in the presence of the Father, in all the glory and splendor of heaven. He relinquished that and took upon himself the form of a servant, and he humbled himself, and he became as a man. And he took on our sin on the cross and was obedient to death. He was obedient to the Father to die paying for our sins. We talk about Christ being our personal Savior. Well, if he is, then we are to forgive others of their sins against us. It's a personal issue. You know what else? Something else here about forgiveness. It can move relationships forward. You know, a lot of times where there has been hurt uh, between two people, it's, it's hard to move forward. Past pain prevents us from thinking that we can move forward. 
And granted, it may take some time, but the direction that forgiveness takes us is forward. It moves us in the direction of reconciliation. Again, I don't want to confuse forgiveness with reconciliation, but forgiveness is the first step in reconciliation. And um, it, it, it sends the relationship. It, it helps us to move forward in that relationship. Paul stated a principle for us in Philippians chapter 3. It's in verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You know, oftentimes when we've been hurt, we are guilty of doing just the opposite of what Paul says in that principle. The one thing I do is forgetting those things which are ahead and reaching back to those things in the past. We forget the future and the possibility that through forgiveness, God can reconcile. We, we forget that and we reach back to the past, to past hurts and offenses. Forgiveness sends us and points us in the direction that is forward, going forward. And it also refuses to keep a record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, the story of Joseph in Genesis is about forgiveness. In fact, an application for you after hearing this sermon might be to read Genesis 37 through the end of the book. Read the life of Joseph and just, just watch his life and listen to what we hear from God about his life and how he forgave. But after he is re reunited with his family, Joseph moves on with his life. He marries a woman and he has two sons. The meaning of those two sons point to Joseph's attitude about his life and how he was going forward. Manasseh means to forget. He says, God has made me forget all my trouble. The name of his second son is Ephraim, which means fruitful. Joseph says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. In naming his sons, Joseph refused to allow the pain of his past to prevent him from being hopeful about tomorrow. If you've been hurt, forgive your offender and give birth to new opportunities. Don't dwell on the past. Move forward. Look ahead. Because forgiveness is freeing. It allows you to release those who have hurt you or who have offended you. It's freeing. Unforgiveness, on the other hand, creates a dark prison for your spirit. It traps your heart in bitterness, locking in all of those emotions deep within you. Unforgiveness, folks, destroys people from the inside out. Don't carry that heaviness, but release it. Enjoy the freedom that forgiveness brings. Christ followers forgive. And God helps us and his spirit helps us to forgive. And then finally this morning, number three, fellowship with God is broken when we refuse to forgive. The goal of praying, verse 12, is one of intimacy and fellowship with the Father. Unforgiveness will affect your fellowship with the Father. You will not be in a right relationship with God if you do not forgive others. Jesus gives us a commentary on this verse. It's actually found in verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 6. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father 
forgive your trespasses. Our fellowship with the Father is riding on whether or not we are willing to forgive others. If you, if you refuse to forgive others who have sinned against you, knowing how much the Father has forgiven you, then don't think that your relationship with Him is right. It's not. He is waiting for you to forgive your brothers or sisters. It's not. He is waiting for you to forgive, and until you do, you're not in a right relationship with Him. It's that serious. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 21, Peter asked Jesus this question. How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? To which Jesus said, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. In other words, as many times as you are offended. Where would, where would we be if God only gave us seven times of forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I'm in trouble. I need more than seven, and I need more than 70, and I need more than 490. <laughs> I need a lot. And the point here is you offer forgiveness whenever someone offends you. Then Jesus gave a parable, a story about a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. One servant owed his master 10,000 talents. Now, a talent back in Jesus' day was the largest denomination of currency. So 10,000 talents signified a debt so large that no one could pay. In fact, specifically, a talent was like 600 days wages. So that's like two years. So one talent was equivalent to two years worth of salary. Well, we have 10,000 talents here. So we're talking, what, 20,000 years worth of salary? It's an innumerable debt, a massive amount of money that this servant owed his master, so much so that he really couldn't repay. So the master of that servant was going to sell him as a slave, along with his wife and children. When that servant heard that, he fell on his knees and he begged his master for patience, promising to repay that debt. The master saw him begging and had compassion on him and released him and forgave the whole debt. Jesus goes on in this story to say that that same servant went out and found another servant who owed him just a small amount of money, just pennies in comparison to the debt he owed the master. And you know what that guy did? That rascal beat that servant up. He had him in a choke hold around his neck, demanding that he pay him back. That servant fell on his knees and begged him. He said, look, man, have patience with me. I will pay you back. I promise. But that wasn't good enough for that servant. You know what he did? He, he threw him into prison until he paid that debt. Well, when the other servants heard what that servant did to this other servant, they told their master. And when the master or the king heard this, he called that servant a wicked servant. So he first identified who he really is. You're wicked. You're a wicked servant. And then Jesus says this in the story. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And the master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. Jesus made his point to Peter and the other disciples. 
Forgiveness received must be forgiveness given. No matter how much others sin against us, they will never owe us as much as we owed God. And we will never have to forgive them for as much as God has forgiven us. Therefore, God expects us who have received his unlimited forgiveness to give others the same forgiveness. This part of the prayer really challenges our tendency to be self-righteous to overlook the deeper issues of our own hearts. It challenges our inconsistencies. We want God to forgive us, but boy, I don't know that I can forgive anybody else, or especially that person. It challenges our inconsistencies. Which is it? We want God to forgive us, but sometimes we have difficulty extending forgiveness to others. And I think it also challenges us with our natural inclination to isolate from troubled relationships. Just move on and not offer forgiveness. Just forget about it. And folks, that is not healthy at all. Unforgiveness will torture you. It will have a deeper impact on you personally than what you desire to happen to your offender. You are hurting yourself more than your offender hurt you. When you have true fellowship with Jesus, then you will prize intimacy and fellowship with him more than seeing your offender hurt. You'll funnel your love more to Jesus than hate to those who have offended you. So in verse 12 of this model prayer, Jesus is instructing us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let me end with this question. Which half of this verse is harder for you? Is it confessing specific sins to God and asking Him to forgive you? Or is it forgiving others as Christ has forgiven you? That's something we all need to pray about. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the instruction of your word taught to us this morning by Christ himself. I pray, Father, that we would think clearly and rightly about our own walk with you, about our own need for daily cleansing, and always being ready and willing to forgive others who sin against us. We certainly need your help as we try to obey this command and apply this to our lives. Help us. Lord, we do not want to be a people who are unforgiving, for we know how that has a terrible effect on our own heart and spirit. We ask you to lead us in proper application of this truth for today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.